All right, since we've already covered utility analysis, where we're doing a constrained optimization, trying to make utility as big as possible with limited resources, limited resources meaning our budget. Now we're going to transition into looking at production analysis and cost analysis. And a lot of the pieces that we have been talking about with maximizing utility and utility functions and indifference curves are going to transition very nicely over into talking about analyzing production functions, although some of the terminology is going to be a little bit different. So over here on the left, we have our terminology and functions that we would normally use with utility. And over on the right, I have some notes and some equivalents of how we're going to use some of the same pieces with different words. Starting with your, our standard utility function, say u equals x to the point 2 times y to the point 8, where the size of the exponents on the good x and the good y, the bigger the exponent means the more that good contributes to utility, ceteris paribus. Now, remember, we could also have a utility function that had a constant in it, like u equals c, uh, could be like the number 5, 15, whatever, times x to some exponent, times y to some exponent. But with utility, we saw that you don't have to have that multiplier. It actually doesn't do anything to the person's preferences. All it does is scale up the units that we're using to measure utils in. So with utility, it doesn't really matter whether somebody gets a hundred utils or a thousand. What matters is that whatever somebody prefers more, we assign a higher number for utility. And so if I like basket A better than basket B, it doesn't really matter whether we call basket A 100 utils or 10, as long as we give basket B a smaller number of utils, then we assign A. So that constant doesn't really matter in the context of utility because utils don't really exist in the real world. They're just an imaginary way to measure or keep track of what kinds of things make somebody happier than somebody else. Kind of like currency. doesn't matter whether we measure the value of something in yen or dollars. We'll have different numbers. But if somebody makes more yen than somebody else, it means that they really make more money. Now over here when we're talking about production, over on the left hand side, instead of U for utility, we have Q and Q is going to represent how many units of output we get whenever we use certain amounts of inputs. So our two inputs we're usually going to stick with are L for labor and K for capital. Now I know that in English capital is not spelled with a K, it's spelled with a C, but we use the letter K for a couple of reasons. Number one, C is usually reserved in economics for cost, like TC would be total cost and ATC would be average total cost. And we don't want to go using the letter C in other places because it's so often associated with being an abbreviation for cost. The other reason is that a lot of the early economists who did research in production functions and cost analysis were German and K for capital in German is, well, that's how you spell capital. So we're going to stick to K as an abbreviation for capital, even though in English that's not the way we spell it. So what we're going to imagine here is in this production function, we might plug in for L, it might be a number of hours total that all of our workers have worked, 100 hours or 200 man hours, or it could be the number of workers that we have on a given day. And then K might be the number of machines or similarly the number of machine hours used. Or if, we, if this was a supercomputer, maybe how many processing units we were using on Amazon's cloud servers or something like that. What we're going to try to do for these problems is figure out the cheapest way to produce a certain level of output. Now, in this context, since Q on the left here is going to be like a number of automobiles produced or a certain number of pounds of wheat that we produce if we're farmers, this number 15 here is meaningful. 
And we can't just drop it and say that it doesn't matter like we did over here whenever we were analyzing utility. Bushels of wheat is not a made up unit when we're talking about Q, whereas utility is. So with utility functions, we can scale them up or scale them down, and it doesn't really matter that much if we do it in a careful way. But with production functions, we can't go around just messing around with the function. How we would come up with these functions is to collect data, go to a firm and say, hey, can you give me past data on, for different days, how much labor you used on that day and how much capital you used on that day, and how much output you produced on that day. And then by doing a statistical analysis, like a regression, then we could estimate all of these constants. In other words, the regression would allow us to figure out that this multiplier is around 15, and that this exponent on labor is about 0.5, and that this exponent on capital is about 0.4. This is something that you should be able to learn about in econometrics. Now, when we're doing this analysis, just to try to help keep us grounded with the same kinds of things we did when we were doing utility analysis, I always like to think about labor as being the thing that we're gonna put on the x-axis and capital as the thing that we're gonna put on the y-axis. And if we keep that consistent, it'll make it a lot easier for us to translate all of these equations and graphs that we've been using with utility analysis into production analysis. Now let's look at some other things that we did in utility analysis. So we talked about the marginal utility of X is the partial derivative of the utility function with respect to X. Marginal utility of Y, similarly. The ratio of marginal utility of X divided by marginal utility of Y gives us marginal rate of substitution. And remember, the marginal rate of substitution in utility analysis tells us the slope of an indifference curve, and it also tells us how many Ys someone would be willing to give up in order to get one more unit of X. In the production world, we have some things that look very similar. The interpretation is gonna be a little bit different though. We have the marginal product of labor, partial derivative of the production function with respect to the number of workers. The marginal product of labor, it's a slope, it's a rate of change, and it tells us how many extra units of output we would get if we add one more worker at a certain point. If we already were planning on using three workers and three machines, and that normally gives us 10 units of output, we're asking what would happen if we added one more worker to get a fourth worker keeping the same three machines. That would be the marginal product of labor or marginal product of the fourth worker. And the marginal product of capital similarly. Partial derivative of production function with respect to capital. And it'll tell us if we added one more machine, how many additional units of output Q would we expect to get? And very similarly, we're gonna be graphing things that look like indifference curves, and we'll get to that in just a minute, but we're gonna have something that is gonna tell us the slope of these curves, and we're gonna call this slope, not the marginal rate of substitution, all we're doing is adding one letter, T. And the T stands for technical. So we're talking about the marginal rate of technical substitution tells us that we're looking at a production sort of context instead of looking at a utility context and a personal choice. We call it the marginal rate of technical substitution in this context with production functions. Now, just like when we were studying utility, if we have a Cobb-Douglas function, Cobb-Douglas production function now, which is actually the context in which Cobb and Douglas invented this kind of function, then we can use the Cobb-Douglas shortcut to find marginal rate of substitution, or in this case, marginal rate of technical substitution. It works exactly the same way. And we'll work a problem in just a second where we'll do that. So I have the interpretations here so we can compare marginal rate of substitution to marginal rate of technical substitution. So in the utility context, it's how many Y we'd be willing to give up to get one more X keeping the same utility, or how many more Y you'd have to give me 
if I lose one X to keep me at the same utility. When we're talking about a production kind of context, marginal rate of technical substitution can tell us how many machines I can turn off if I get one more unit of labor. Remember, we're going to put labor on the X axis. And so it tells us how many machines we could lose if we get one more unit of X, one more unit of labor. Or moving the other direction, it would tell us how many more machines we would need to obtain if we lose one unit of labor. So if one worker doesn't show up for work, that marginal rate of technical substitution gives you an idea of how many more machines you would need to replace that lost worker. So as I was mentioning a minute ago, we're going to have something similar to indifference curves, but in the context of production, we call these things isoquants. And this prefix iso just means same. So it's very similar to the prefix homo. So homo means same, iso means same. So along an ISO quant, we're producing the same amount of output. Just like with an indifference curve, everywhere along a, the same indifference curve, we're looking at the same amount of utility. The next piece that we looked at in utility analysis were budget lines. So budget lines, just something we could graph to show all the different ways we could spend our money with a certain fixed budget. So our budget has to be equal to the price of X times X plus the price of Y times Y. In production analysis, instead of calling it a budget line, we call it an ISO cost. Again, the same prefix, ISO. So an ISO cost is a line we can graph where all points on that line would cost us the same amount. And so all the points of that along the line will have different amounts of labor and capital that we could buy with the same budget or the same total cost. So instead of writing it budget equals, usually we'll say, well, this is a way of calculating our total cost. So total cost equals the price of capital times capital plus the price of labor times labor. Now, another little bit more popular way to write the exact same idea is instead of writing the price of capital, PK, to write R. And this R, you can think about as standing for the rental rate of capital. So if we don't own these machines, we might rent them. So how much does it cost me to rent these machines per hour or per day? Whatever units of time we're using here. Another way to think about this rental rate of capital is maybe it has something to do with the interest rate. Maybe we do own the machines, but we borrowed money to buy these machines. And so we're having to pay interest on the loans. The more capital we own, the bigger those payments are going to be for the interest. Now, even if we own these machines outright, still we can think about the cost of capital being related to the interest rate. Instead of owning those machines, especially if we aren't using them, we could sell the machines and invest the money, earning some kind of return that would probably be somehow related to an interest rate in one way or another. So our rental rate of capital or related to the interest rate, it's how much does each unit of capital cost us depending on the situation, whether we rent, whether we borrowed, or whether it's the opportunity cost of money. And then W we'll use for wage. So we could say the price of labor, or we could just call it W for the wage. Another thing we're going to run into when we're talking about production analysis is what kind of decision making are we trying to model here? Sometimes we might be thinking in the short run, what kind of choices am I making? other times in the long run. Now, if we're talking about short run decision making, then normally in economics, we'll assume that capital is considered fixed in the short run. In economics, the short run is a short enough time to where at least one input is fixed and cannot be changed. Normally capital, the number of buildings or machines that we have, it's going to take us longer time to change than it would to just keep our workers longer 
or let our workers go home early or bring in another worker or send a worker home. Usually we'll consider capital to be the fixed cost that we can't change in the short run, but if you give us a long enough planning horizon, three months or six months or a year, we will be able to change both the amount of labor and the amount of capital. Let's look at an example kind of problem that we might want to solve. And it's going to be related to what we did when we were solving for this decomposition basket when we were looking at income and substitution effects. In that kind of problem for utility, the problem we would often want to solve is find the amount of goods X and Y that you'd want to buy someone that is the cheapest way, so minimizing the cost, to give someone a certain amount of utility. In a production context, we're going to be doing the same kind of thing just substituting X and Y for capital and labor, and we want to minimize the cost to give us a certain amount of output, say Q equals 150. Let's work a practice problem here so we can see how all these pieces fit together. So suppose this is our production function, Q equals 15 times L to the 0.5 times Q to the 0.4, and we have to pay our workers, say, $5 per hour per day, doesn't really matter. As long as the production function is measured in the same kind of time units as the wage and the rental rate of capital, let's say $5 per worker and $10 per machine. What is the cheapest way to produce 150 units of output? Just like we did when we were doing those decomposition baskets for utility, we're going to have two equations and two unknowns. First equation, set the marginal rate of technical substitution that's the slope of these isoquants. We're going to set the slope of those isoquants equal to the slope of the budget line or the iso cost line now. So using our trick to find the marginal rate of substitution or technical substitution, we just take the, again, remember we're thinking about L as the X variable and K as the Y variable here. And so we're going to take the exponent on the X, 0.5, times y, well y is now k, divided by the exponent on the y variable k, so that's the 0.4, times x, well l. So we're just translating on the fly here, doing the same kind of thing. And so this marginal rate of technical substitution function here will tell us the slope of an isoquant at any point. Set that equal to the ratio of w over r, the price of labor divided by the price of capital price of x divided by the price of y. So that's 5 over 10. We could go ahead and simplify that and go ahead and solve it for either k or l. Again, just to keep things kind of the same kind of flow, I'm always going to solve for k. So 5 over 4 is what? 1.25 k over l equals, and then 5 over 10 is a half. And then we want to solve this for k, so we're going to multiply both sides by L. And now we're going to divide both sides by 1.25. And that'll cancel over there. And so what we end up with here is going to be 2 fifths L. So k equals 2 fifths, or we'll just call it 0.4L. Probably the cleanest way to write that. And so now we want to go to the second equation. And the second equation is our production function. And we want to just say, okay, well, our goal here is to produce 150 units of output. So we plug that in for Q. And then we plug the fact that we know that K, the amount of machines we're going to use, is going to be 0.4 times as many workers as we use. And so we're going to plug that into our second equation. So we're going to have 150 equals 15 times L to the 0.5 times K, but K is 0.4L. And don't forget that exponent, all raised to the 0.4. And what we're going to do is distribute this 0.4 exponent to the 0.4 and the L. Let's go ahead and do that. So 0.4 to the 0.4 and L to the point 0.4. And now we want to collect all of our constants and collect our L's together. 
see how many workers we're going to use. So let's take care of all the constants first. Here we have a 15 and here we have a 0.4 to the 4. So let's collect those together. 15 times 0.4 raised to the 0.4. I'm getting about 10.4 there. And what we're going to want to do is divide both sides of this equation by that amount, the 10.4. So let's just go ahead and do that. 10.4, 10.4, and then that's going to cancel the 15 and the 4 to the 0.4, and of course that'll cancel. And now we can collect the L's on the right hand side, and we're going to end up with L to the 0.9 equals, and now we need to know what 150 divided by 10.4 is, and I'm getting about 14.42. And now we need to get rid of that 0.9 power. And the way to get rid of any exponent is to do what? Yes, raise both sides to the inverse of that power. So raise both sides to the 1 over 0.9. 1 over 0.9 is just 1.1111111. So we're raising both sides to the 1.1111111 power. Let's see what we get. And depending on how you round it and how many ones you put in there, I'm getting 19.4. So L is going to be 19.4 workers or 19.4 hours worked. And then we can solve for how much capital we're going to get. So K equals and we're going to do that by plugging that 19.4 for L into this equation over here. K is 0.4 times L. So just take that 19.4 and multiply it times 0.4. I get about 7.76. So we've just figured out the cheapest way to produce 150 units given that our production function looks like this. If you ever want to double check, did I mess up something there? We can always plug L equals 19.4 into our production function and K equals 7.76 in there and make sure that we get something very close to 150 to make sure that we did this right. But what we really want to know as a result of doing this problem isn't only how much labor and capital we need to use to produce this the cheapest way, but how much is it going to cost? So that's where we want to use a function like a budget equation. Total cost equals the price of capital times capital plus the wage times labor. And so let's figure out how much it would actually cost. Now recall that our wage was $5 per worker. Our cost of capital was $10 each. So we just plug them in and see how much is this going to cost us. So $10 times 7.76 machines plus five dollars times 19.4 workers gives me about a hundred and seventy four dollars and sixty cents and that is not everything we'll want to know but that's good enough for our first problem that we work like this so the cheapest way to produce 150 units 19.4 workers, 7.76 machines, and it's going to cost us about $175 to do this. As always, I like to graph the solution to get a visual representation of what's going on and to double check to make sure we didn't just goof up somewhere. So let's graph this budget line. Now we're calling it an ISO cost line, but it's exactly the same thing. We're just graphing what are all the ways we could spend $174.60 on laborers and machines. And remember, we're always going to put labor down here on the x-axis, and we're going to put capital up here on the y-axis. Suppose we spent all $174.60 on workers. How many could we afford? Well, let's see down here. If we took our... 174.60, so 174.60, and we divided it by $5, which is the cost of each worker, we get a number um, almost 35, not quite 35. Okay, so pretty close. 
And then if we took that same amount of money, $174.60, and we divided it by the price of machines, divide it by 10, we're just moving the decimal place over one. So that's going to be up almost 17 and a half. So let's call it somewhere right about here. And if we connect those two with a straight line, what are we looking for? Well, we're going to plot our solution. 19.4 workers and 7.76 machines. Okay, so just, just below 20 on the X. And then if we look over here, this should be about seven and a half, between seven and a half and eight machines. Yeah, I buy that. That's pretty close. And we want to make sure that it's on our budget line. Yes that it's on the ISO quant for 150 units. Yes, it's that dark gray one that we're just barely tangent to there. And here's what we're saying. Any ISO cost, new, new word for a budget line, right? Any ISO cost is gonna have this slope of a half. We could draw other ISO costs if we want. Here, let me just paste another one on here. So this green ISO cost, it has the same slope as the red one. But what we're looking for is an ISO cost that has the same slope as the red one, but it's the one that is closest to the origin, meaning the lowest cost, but it also has to be something where we're actually capable of producing 150 units. And so what we want is to find the cheapest way of producing the 150 units. Now with an ISO cost like this green one, we could produce 150 units this way, using about 11 workers and 16 machines, or this way, using about 37 workers and um, maybe four machines. But see how both of those options would cost more than the red budget line. Again, we're calling it an ISO cost now, but I'm helping us transition to the new lingo. So this is the budget line that is closest to the origin, but high enough to get us to where we can actually produce the 150 units. So it's the cheapest way. All right, I'm going to end this video here. And in the next video, I'm going to come back and we're going to talk about some more lingo, some more terms and definitions that we need to be familiar with as we start to analyze production and cost concepts. I'll see you then.